Welcome to the Working Fans Podcast, Mr. McMahon, Netflix documentary review, episode four, myself, the man called Dave. And before we talk about Mr. McMahon, we are going to talk about our sponsor, Game Up Heart Hydration. It's like your favorite sports drink, your favorite seltzer got together, but it's so much better. Dave, give him the rundown. Guys, it comes in four great flavors. We're talking fruit punch, orange, lemon, lime, and grape, and it's only 110 calories so it's low carb you don't even have to feel guilty about enjoying some game up what you might feel guilty about <laughs> is enjoying some wwe given mr mcmahon the deeper we go in this documentary the wilder the insights into his mind get like mm. when we first watched this we watched it all at once and i think a lot of things you kind of you know you might forget about or you might not remember as well when you binge watch it but then when you go back and watch individual episodes, it's very interesting. Like on this one, it starts off with Vince talking about Dr. Jerry Graham. He mm -hmm. was he became Vince's favorite because he was bleach blonde. He would light yeah. cigars with hundred dollar bills. He was a heel and Vince never liked the good guys, he said. And then we hear Vince starting to imitate Dr. Jerry Graham, dyeing his hair, strutting around. He liked Jerry, Gra Jerry Graham's insane driving in his red right. convertible. And, you know, he has that quote, yeah, that's what I want to be. Dave, what did you kind of think about Vince talking about one of the people in the wrestling business that he actually enjoyed? It's so different because, you know, Vince doesn't seem to really, most of the Vince we've seen doesn't seem to even really enjoy the wrestling business. We have seen there's those few rare people he's had respect for before, like Andre the Giant, that he will occasionally get emotional about. But for the most part, Vince is kind of the alpha of the room. So to hear, and we, I have heard this before, but to hear like talking about Dr. Jerry Graham was someone he looked up to. It's kind of interesting. It's, you, it's just something you don't really associate with him until you hear it. Also, it's like, it just makes sense. Like when you hear how wild Dr. Jerry Graham was and all the crazy stuff that he was doing, of course, that's who Vince would probably, you know, try to emulate himself after. Yeah, for more of how crazy Dr. Jerry Graham is, check out our Vandal Drummond interview. He also spent some time with Jerry Graham and definitely... I mean, he paints a wild picture of Jerry Graham, but you have to hear Vandal Drummond describe it him himself. It is very interesting. So after we come out of the Jerry Graham talk, we talk about really the creation of the Mr. McMahon character coming out of the Montreal screw job. He Vince always wanted to be in the business, but his dad wouldn't let him. And this was a time where he used the re the heat that he was receiving off the screw job to create his character and that really changed the course of the wwf wcw battle after 83 weeks now dave when you first saw this mr mcmahon character when you were younger what did you think of it i was intrigued because vince was always the commentator and as we progressed into the attitude era even before the screw drop we started to see hints of different things going on with Vince where they were acknowledging that Vince was the owner. You know, Austin stunned the owner of the company. Brett had that famous interaction where Vince pulled his, like, shirt or hockey jersey over his head and they're, like, trying to had to restrain them from each other. You know, all done in character. Brett shoves Vince on his ass after a cage match. That's kind of ironic looking back that a lot of that had to do with Brett, too. But, you know, it was still very different. But I still remember leading into WrestleMania. This all really happened after WrestleMania. The screw job is what set it up. But it really started to heat up after WrestleMania. But I always remember this interview. And they don't talk about it here. And this is just something that popped in my head now. Where Vince is interviewed by kevin kelly as the owner of the company and kelly was asking him there are a lot of people think that you don't want to see stone cold as the world champion in the wwf he's like what do you have to say and he's like he kept trying not to answer the question and then kelly's like you what do you want to he's like well it's not no that i don't want to see him as champion if i may borrow from steve it's a oh hell no <laughs> you know i remember like oh shit what was that and then, yeah, eventually we're going to see the character of Mr. McMahon born. And I, I just really, it was, it was wild. I didn't know what to make of it at first. And yeah, it was always weird. It was definitely weird at first to see Vince as a bad guy because he had really just played up himself as the announcer for the longest time. Yeah, and we'll see that as it goes on that he might not have ever necessarily saw himself as the bad guy. But 
with the documentary, they go from the creation of Mr. McMahon coming out of the Montreal screw job to kind of the creation of the attitude era. They talk about Shawn Michaels stuffing his shorts as being kind of one of those early times when there started to be a change in the way the WWF presented its product. Things got grittier, dirtier, a little more sexual. And Triple H says it was a slow evolution. And you kind of saw DX at the center of that. A lot of the antics they were doing were kind of that new, you know, way of thought for the WWF. That's how it really came off here. It was definitely, uh, we've heard some of this on the Bruce Pritchard podcast too, where, you know, Vince didn't like what Sean was doing at first, but then he kind of grew on him and Bruce and Pat tried to tell Vince, you know, like, I think we need to do something like that. And they're like, I don't want to hear anything about Shawn Michaels. And he's mad. And then later on, Vince would be like, that's attitude. That's Shawn's guy. That's what we need to do. You know, almost like Vince created the idea himself. So Yeah, and he was mad at uh, Pat and Bruce, if Bruce. I remember, for not pointing it out to him earlier, he said. Right. <laughs> right. Bruce is bad. Like, All right. <laughs> Let's go with it. <laughs> Thought we said that about a month ago. Yeah, typical Vince. You know, as they start to progress and talk about that, too, it, it really seems like. It was very hot and cold, but once the ratings started really <laughs> to see uh, a turnaround, Vince, of course, was all for it. Yeah, and Triple H really said that same thing, too, because he'd talk about how they'd come back and Vince would tell him, like, you can't be doing shit like that. Like, you're going to get in trouble. But they kept going out and doing it. They kept seeing a response and things worked in their favor. Now, as they talk about DX being at the center of the Attitude Era, they kind of... We have a section here discussing the rise of Stone Cold. You, they talk about him coming up in WCW. And what, what, what I thought was an interesting choice for the documentary, at least, was to discuss the importance of ECW in the wrestling industry while talking about Stone Cold coming through there, which almost gives the idea that he had more involvement in ECW than he did. Yeah, because, I mean, he was only real at ECW for a cup of coffee. I think he had two matches when all was said and done. But he did really learn to cut. I don't want to say, you know, he could cut a good promo in WCW, arrogant. But he really, really, really started to home that in at ECW. And ECW, of course, was really doing all the stuff that the Attitude Era and WCW, like ECW was the place that had most of the Attitude. I mean, they had... A lot of sexual stuff happened on there. They had a lot of blood and violence. I guess in a small way, I mean, even though he was only there for a little bit, it did help propel Steve Austin. One thing I would say that I thought was interesting, like you said, like it's like maybe you think Austin had more to do with ECW than he did the way they entwined that, but Steve made that comment. And then I went to ECW and I was even more on Vince's radar. But I don't feel like that's the case because, I mean, if he once he came in, Vince didn't really treat him like a big deal necessarily right away. He gave him that ringmaster gimmick. He didn't let him talk. So I think that Steve basically got himself over due to the fact that it was Steve not willing to let things go. And the timing where Vince was kind of throwing his hands up and kind of letting people do what they want more. Yeah, because the ringmaster was supposed to be like somebody that was very good in ring. And, I mean, you would have only seen that from his time in WCW. In ECW, it was more his talking that got a little more of a workout. And, you know, eventually he goes on to win the King of the Ring while Triple H is punished. And I thought it was crazy because, I mean, we've seen the promo before. But thinking about it in the terms of this documentary, Stone Cold came out of one promo with two big catchphrases that he still uses to this day. And that is... That's such a wild thing because some people are lucky to get a catchphrase in a whole career and he got two in a night and he was off to the races with that one. Yeah, I guess it really just shows you what a great personality, character and overall performer Stone Cold was and what a time for him to have caught on to when wrestling was so hot. So, yeah, pretty cool. Exactly. Wrestling was so hot that as Stone Cold is getting big, WWF is able to bring in Mike Tyson. And yes. it's interesting to hear from Shane in this because when we've heard about Tyson coming into WWF, we heard how big an, a thing it was for Shane. Big to bring him in with his reputation because he right. was a dangerous boxer. He had the criminal record. So 
all those things together coming into the WWF was huge. One of the biggest things, one of my biggest takeaways in this is they have a clip of Stephanie not knowing if Tyson had been convicted of rape before they worked with him. And then (laughs) she finds out he had. And just the look she gives the camera is exactly the look that somebody that's conditioned to not sell would give. You know, you can see a hint of disappointment in her eyes, but she's like, well, that happened. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah, that was very. It, I, I can see where that was one, where maybe Vince and Bruce didn't like the editing of the documentary. But it's still, it is what it is. So I mean, as a person who watches this, I appreciate it. I appreciate the raw honesty of it. That is what happened. You know, getting back to the Tyson thing for a little bit though, too. There's a thing where Austin has talked about it before with the ratings with uh, WCW, how they were losing, but he said they felt like they had a better program at one point. And it's like, what could they do? And they really pointed out it was Tyson. It was Tyson. And we, Hey, we've been reviewing shows from that era and Joe will talk about it. That 96, 97 era of WWE where it's like, man, this shit is pretty good. But it wasn't until in the beginning of 98 when they brought Mike Tyson in that eventually led to Austin and McMahon where they really turned the corner. So they needed that Mike Tyson to put eyes on their company to get him to that next level. Even if what, what came with Tyson was all that baggage and Stephanie McMahon wasn't uh, aware of it at the time. Yeah, Tyson's heat definitely sold tickets. You go from talking about Tyson to they go to that after WrestleMania press conference where Vince is talking about it, saying he's always been a good guy. And you got that one reporter laughing, saying, but they're booing you. And Vince just further shaking it off like I've always been the good guy. And Vince and Stone Cold's rivalry further changed the game. There were no more good guys now. This is kind of when everybody was shades of gray and you know kind of you know emblematic of the attitude era time where it's like your good guys were still just better heels you know not as evil as somebody else so it was interesting how the whole wrestling archetype was changing on that time yeah we have vince made that video we're tired i think we think you're tired of having your intelligence insulted as wrestling fans we're not going to present the old passe good guys versus bad guys and of course you know that's what we got we got a lot of these shades of gray and it worked and i don't know if we were going to go into it anyway but like obviously eric bischoff at the time will tell you that almost arrogantly he didn't take it very seriously he thought they were going to come up with more like going to clowns and stuff like that and it wasn't until mike tyson came along where eric was like oh yeah now vince talks about not liking rich people he always felt looked down on and that comes from his childhood and i don't doubt there were other people that i don't doubt there were people that made him feel this way but i mean could he be talking about meeting his father's other family because remember when he actually first went to stay with his dad they had a loving home that they were all a part of and vince always both from his words and his cousin's words always kind of felt like a little bit of an outsider. So could these feelings have possibly come from that other family? He doesn't specify who made him feel less than, but that definitely feels like some trauma coming back at him. Yeah. And I mean, that's a great call. I mean, who knows, but that's definitely a good theory. Yeah. And it would explain how he was able to really tap into this character. You know, yeah, because he was playing Although, everything he hated, he said. Yeah. Although, well, you know, I mean, we will talk about this, but I mean, a lot of people feel like that character and Vince are one and the same. But that is, is actually the section we are on because they ask him how much of the Mr. McMahon character is him. And Vince says he shares none of Mr. McMahon's right. similarities. And then I counted it because you had one, two, five other views, yeah. point of views on this. And it's great because you have Shane saying Mr. McMahon is an extension of Vince, but blown way out of proportion. Mm -hmm. Shawn Michaels, the difference between Mr. McMahon and Vince McMahon. And then he chuckles a little bit and he says, probably not that much. Hogan, exactly the same person. It's not a far stretch. Uh, Bruce, Mr. McMahon is Vince. He'll tell you different. Right. So he's saying like, that's him. He'll tell you different, but I've had all those promos cut on me, which is interesting because Vince is usually or Bruce is usually the voice sticking up for Vince. And here it's like that direct contradiction. And then Stone Cold, the Mr. McMahon character is pretty close to Vince, just highly exaggerated. 
So, you know, what we've heard about a wrestling character, but it's interesting that Vince sees none of the similarities. Yeah, but all the people who are either A, closest working with him, family members, or the top performers of his era that he had to work extremely close with all say different. <laughs> so, yeah. What do you want? And then another good quote from Vince, perception is reality and you can't change how people think about you, which very true. It's probably the most insightful thing that Vince says in this whole documentary, but it seems to be maybe the bit of advice that he forgets about most often when talking about other people, because then you've got Eric Bischoff talking about how everything that Vince did was really just kind of copying him. You know, he says DX was derivative of NWO. Vince was derivative of Bischoff. And Vince doesn't act like he stole. He said, well, if Eric did do it first, I, I did it better. Yeah. So but it's Eric, one of those things where the whole narrative kind of gets lost when you get to the end point, at least on WWF side. But Eric said the same thing. He said good on him for doing it better. His point was that he just did it first. That's true. You know, it's funny. The NWO was a derivative. DX was a derivative from NWO. It's interesting because I could definitely see that. But, you know, I mean, factions were around for a while. Was DX trying to invade the WWF? I don't remember that. But there were a lot of similarities because... Kevin Nash, Sky Hall, Shawn Michaels, and Triple H were all great friends. I remember thinking back at that time that I think Sean even cut the promo. The click rules the industry. So that it's all shades of gray. It's very interesting. But Eric definitely has some great points, especially with the heel authority figure. I can't think of anyone to my knowledge too many times that did that, especially on a big stage like Eric did. When you look at the whole DX and NWO thing, NWO, they they definitely had the invasion storyline. Right. I think the only similarities are just these two hot factions at the center of that company. You know, because DX, rather than being invading, they were the people that were left in the company. Right. And they kind of just made, you know, they got friends around them that became a faction and they were able to build it up. So uh, similarities, but the NWO was just so much hotter because it felt like that invasion, and yeah. there were so many big things around it like that. NWO turned that company around, too. DX didn't really turn the company around. It just kind of helped propel it to the next level, which was going to be Steve Austin, Vince McMahon, which was going to turn things around. Yeah, DX was just mainly a vehicle to really kind of usher in that attitude era. And they were the group that could do the wildest things to set the tone for everybody. Speaking of setting the tone, you go from talking about DX to you're talking about the rise of the rock. They talk yeah. about rocks, family connections, working for the McMahon family. And I couldn't remember this, but did rocks career really blow up after nitro started losing? So that's a good question. Cause it's that's where it's similar. positioned in this documentary. To, yeah. If you go back to our watch along of that bad blood in 97, the Rock is just starting to be a bad guy with the nation. So 98 is going to be where they turn it around. And that's what I mean. And if you look at that WrestleMania that year, Rock was in a feud with Ken Shamrock. So, yeah, I would say he started to blow up right when they were winning the Monday Night Wars a lot because he had that feud with Triple H, where Triple H was the new leader of DX. Sean was gone. And they were more the baby faces and rock. They had kicked Farouk out. So, yeah, that's pretty accurate. Wow, that's wild. And WWF shoved Rocky Maivia down people's throats. He was hated. The Rock's heel turn with the nation that we saw. And then that's kind of where things turned around for him. Even though the nation was like this pro-black group, it wasn't a race thing. It was a respect thing. Because you remember when he first came in, you had the die, Rocky, die chance. And you had multiple people saying Vince doesn't care about color. He cares about drawing money. Right. Yeah. And from what I've seen, Vince definitely cares about drawing money. Yeah. But I think he cares about color a little bit, too. So I'm going to I'm glad you brought this up. I actually forgot to put this in my notes, but I actually wanted to talk about this because I have a theory on this and I don't care if it is what that is because it's just how I feel. But I've talked about this in life with other people before. I think people sometimes, especially with people who are racist, and I don't know that this man is racist, but this is just my personal experience. People who are racist can be, you have like your hateful races that are full with anger and they're very dangerous and they may do bad things. And then you have these ignorant races who just say dumb, hateful things and are a little hateful. But then you have this other like third racist 
they come from a different time period and they do stupid things and they perceive stupid things, but they don't even know they're doing it. You know what I mean? Like that grandma who says something like, oh, hey, get out of here, grandma. Don't, we don't say that no more, right? Yeah. So, so many people and people of color like Tony Atlas even too are saying, no, Vince only cares about green. That might be true, but he certainly perceived people a certain way. He certainly looked at people, whether it mattered to him. He thought, oh, Saba Simba, this is going to make me some money, I guess, then. And that's, that's what you're telling me, which is ridiculous. So maybe Vince is just that type of guy. Maybe he's just that, like, ignorant racist and doesn't even realize, like, oh, that's kind of racist and you shouldn't do that. You know, just a thought, just a theory. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Another, and I feel like this happens a lot of times during this documentary where they'll have a little montage of WWF getting bigger into the culture. Because, I mean, once it was rock, once it was stone cold and that attitude era really blew up. I mean, you've got WWF getting on Total Request Live. You have them getting on Saturday Night Live, getting on Conan. Uh, Dave, for people that weren't alive during this time period, tell people how big TRL was. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just that's one of those things where every day people were tuning in. Carson Daly became like a huge, huge star because of TRL. And it, it just this time period of wrestling was just that huge. You know, I mean, it went from it was such a niche thing to they were on so many different mainstream things I, i've said this before i think that i remember working at the casino up here and you know nobody really talking about wrestling and then all of a sudden i'm seeing people get off the bus you know going to work and people are wearing nwo shirts and then another group of people are coming in and saying if you smell la, 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 and they have austin 36 i'm like what the hell happened <laughs> you know yeah it was where wrestling went from just like wrestling fans were aware of it to now your average person was aware of it that was wild for wrestling fans because like as a wrestling fan, there's always a degree of oddness to it. Like even today, when you tell people you're a wrestling fan, people kind of look at you a certain way and they're like, do you believe it? And they're like, no, it's just what I watch because it's like that form of entertainment. But during this attitude era, that's kind of where that grew. Now, as it grew, uh, one of my, another one of my favorite sections of this documentary is questionable content in wrestling. And my first note is just blackface, rape, guns, and sex. Because that's a little bit of what this montage was. They were showing you all of the more yeah. extreme things that WWF was doing. And it was great because at one point, I believe Vince says there's no rape, guns, or knives. And then yeah. they show multiple instances of each of those. Brian Pillman gun in the camera. Yeah. Yeah, the Brian Pillman gun instance, the parody of a casterization with uh, Kai and Ty and Val Venus. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that all happened. You know, WWF really pushing the limits. Vince claimed they were still family friendly, but more of an adult family, which yeah. to me is just the most hilarious uh, justification in your own mind. You know, exploitive of women from a marketing standpoint, it was successful. I forgot to write down whose quote that was. I'd like to think it's Vince's. And it was wild that to mm, market to a male audience, they were very exploitive of women. And it's what drew a lot of people in. You know, watching it with 2024 eyes, we'd like to say like, oh, this isn't what like pulled me in about wrestling, but Sable and Sonny were like two of the centerpieces around that time, mm -hmm. not treated fairly and definitely were used to pull in a mostly male audience. Hell, they were even trying to do it to Luna Vachon, which is insane. But, you know, it kind of led from what I understand to a little bit of her disillusionment with the business, which is sad because uh, where we're at now with female wrestling is so much bigger. And this is a time where it was just clearly tits and ass. Yeah, eye candy. That's what Trish Stratus even said herself was we were predominantly seen as eye candy back then. And then Triple H with maybe his first questionable quote of this documentary. And he kind of ends it. It's a low key sentence, but it's who's worse, the guy that did it or the people that loved it? I don't know. And I was like, Woo. yeah, that's wild considering he's the man in charge right now. And it's probably the most pro. I don't know. It's the only thing that he said in this documentary that I'm like, Ooh, I don't know where that came from. Yeah. I, I thought the same thing too. I remember my thought was 
Yeah, who's worse, the person who murdered people or the people who just stood there and watched? It's like, oh, the person who murdered people, Hunter, that was the fucking probably the worst person. I'm like, where did that analogy come from? But yeah, that would you Well, I think it's because, you know, he doesn't want to point the finger at Vince as being bad, not thinking that, you know, it's human nature to watch what's going yeah. on. And it's sometimes the worse the situation, the more people will look like, Think about a car accident when there's one on one side of the highway, but then the the traffic stops on the other side because people are slowing down to watch. So it's just human nature to watch us calamity like that. Yeah, he's just trying to say that are the people who watch this any better? And it's like, well, they're not worse. <laughs> you know, uh, 100%. And speaking of a calamity that nobody saw, the final section of this part of the documentary, it's about Owen Hart. Yeah. They talk about how after Brett left, he felt like the WWF was trying to embarrass Owen. Vince says that that statement only speaks to Brett's ego because they were trying to make Owen a star. Yeah. Uh, they talk about Owen's death. And what were your takeaways from the discussion of Owen's death? <sighs> I don't know if they were trying to get back at Brett, but I don't know how you can say you were trying to make this guy a star by having him be some parody of a superhero you know i don't know what they thought you know if anything they just saw him at a certain level i guess they just saw him as this comic relief so it's interesting because you know brett forgave him because he realized there was no foul play involved obviously there i don't think there was any foul play nothing showed was foul play but boy there was some real neglect that they get into you know they said that the people that they used gave them a faulty harness well that's true but what about the fact that they wanted to save money and they stopped going to the person who they were originally using? We didn't even cover that. For that, I don't know if it was as much saving money, but I, had, from what I understand, when Owen got lowered any other time, it took him an extra second to get out of the harness. Yeah. You know, right. and it kind of led to some delay. So I think they were trying to find somebody that could do what they wanted with a quick release. I'm sure money was probably somehow involved, but I the way I've always understood it was kind of the timing of the stunt. But you're right. I do remember that as well now. But regardless, I mean, it's just one of the most unfortunate things that happened. And whether, you know, accident or not, I mean, yeah, they should have just canceled the show. And like going back, looking at it now, like with his blood still in the ring and seeing Deborah and Jeff both just break, you know, character and start to cry while they're trying to like get through this interview it's very apparent like nobody was in the shape that mentally they should have been there and i i hate to dispel everything about this but i think i heard on another podcast that some of the blood in the ring might not have been from owen okay i don't know if there was a brood entrance before this but there was something else where blood could have gotten onto the ring from that i can't remember the exact thing right now but it might not necessarily have been Owens. Either way, there were boards broken in the ring from where he fell. And at the base level, a man died in that ring. So to make people wrestle in the ring is a little wild. Now we got, obviously, we've always known Vince is the showman. He wants to go on. He would say, he said if it was him or his son, he'd want the show to go on. Right. But a big takeaway from this is his decision to have the show go on is because most people in the arena didn't see what happened. Mm -hmm. It happened during a blackout. It was a flash. I mean, to this day, no pictures have really come out about it. No footage of the incident. So to say that had people seen it, he would have canceled the show. But since no one did, you know, it's kind of what it is. That that was interesting to hear from Vince, but it was also pretty, pretty dirty. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, he's always said that. So that's how this guy feels but uh it's wild i don't know i don't know how you can not just say that yeah we in retrospect should have canceled the show yeah and they go into vince talking about it wasn't their fault it was an equipment malfunction he was able to sue the company and one i don't think it got i don't think it told enough of that story but i mean at, at this point we're four episodes deep we've had multiple things you know, that have happened to him that they haven't told the whole story. So I don't know how mad you can really get. 
But, you know, we're kind of ending this episode thinking, were they pushing too far to entertain fans? And as wrestling fans, yeah, sometimes the more amped up the action is, the more we get into it. Around that time, they weren't afraid to push the gas on that. So they probably did go a little too far, but it's a lot of people's most favorite era in wrestling, which is kind of crazy after seeing this. Yeah, I mean, there's an intensity in that era. You know, you go back and you watch some angles and matches and you're like, holy shit. And you hear that crowd. There's definitely intensity to it. But you also can't dismiss a lot of the other stuff that happened, too. Yeah. Now we are two thirds of the way through this documentary after four episodes. How are you feeling about rewatching it? Because this episode, I kind of felt like dipped for me a little bit. I enjoyed the scandals a little more because to me. The scandals almost felt like real world things they were doing wrong, you know, that weren't featured on TV. These are kind of the scandals that happened on TV. And I probably feel a certain way about it because I was watching during this time. And a lot of this stuff was what was entertaining me. Obviously, now as an adult, I'm like, ooh, wow, I can't believe I watched some of that stuff. But I like this episode, but I didn't like it necessarily as much as like any of the first three. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much I can't disagree with that. I. At, I said to you before we got on air that this is the one I took probably the least amount of notes for. I think it's because at times I just felt a little disenfranchised with it. You know, like, okay, yeah, I've seen this. You know what I mean? It's just, but there were still some of those same quotes that got me, that got you, like Hunter with that ridiculous statement, you know, and there's some of the other stuff with Vince. So it's just, it's still drawing me in, but I definitely felt the least connected to this episode. Yeah, and we are going to be, we're going to get very connected because the next two episodes, arguably two of the biggest ones, the next one digs into family dynamics. And I feel like we're going to go even longer than we did here. And then episode six is the end. So, you know, kind of tying together everything they've given you with modern scandals. But we want to thank you for joining us for another week of the Mr. McMahon documentary series. And you know, after you're watching this, you're going to feel a little dirty. You're going to you're going to need to, you know, kind of feel better about yourself. And there's no better way to feel better about yourself than Game Up Hard. If you haven't tried Game Up, then you are missing out. Imagine your favorite seltzer and your favorite sports drink had a baby. But it's way better than that. Each can is 110 calories, low carb, 4.9 ABV. It's a nice light drink that is not light on flavor. Game Up comes in fruit punch, orange, lemon, lime, and grape. Pick it up at drinkgameup.com or at your nearest liquor store.